at a high level, the framework is based on testing what matters. And when I say what matters, there are so many tests that we can run, laboratory tests and field tests. But what are the things that really matter? What are the things that best predict how well you're going to live, how long you're going to live, what your life satisfaction is like? Not only things that we can measure that matter, but number two, things that we can intervene on. We can go out and measure lots of stuff, but if there's no scientific evidence showing that we can improve it, then how useful is it? So criteria two was tests that we can actually intervene on with some, some type of specificity, some solid peer-reviewed randomized controlled trial evidence shows, hey, if you do this habit, you can improve this important biomarker or marker of health. And then after we intervene, we're going to retest because that's where we learn. We learn, we can see where we've improved and perhaps where we need to refine things to shift our focus to areas where maybe there's room for improvement or more room for improvement. What happens if we don't test? Well, I think we know. I think we can look around uh, and 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 see in our communities, many people are not looking underneath the hood. You know, we're going through life kind of unaware of our physiology, our risk factors. Less than 7% of adults in the USA have what we would describe as optimal cardiometabolic health. And as such, they have either already been diagnosed with a chronic disease, you know, fatty liver disease or prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or they are on the path to a diagnosis. You know, a lot of these conditions bubble away under the surface for a while before you have that diagnosis. If we are not testing, then we don't know where to aim. It's hard to be intentional with our lifestyle if we're not seeing where our current health status is. And so this is akin to kind of throwing darts at a dartboard with the lights off, how, how do you know where to aim? How accurate are you going to be? And it also allows us to kind of fall easily fall victim to distractions, shiny objects, things that perhaps don't matter as much. This is a really important takeaway point. What you measure, you can optimize with purpose. What you measure, you can optimize with purpose. Let's come back to the part one of this framework, which is testing. And I said testing what matters. So testing, we, we again, we, we have so many things that we could test. There's a long laundry list um, of things that we could test. But we had these, these criteria that we developed before we came to our list of things that, that we, we test within the framework. And these criteria were tests that reliably predict long-term physical health, life satisfaction, and or longevity. They have to be tests that are easily conducted and accessible. No point us get putting these tests out that are difficult to conduct, not validated, and perhaps are expensive or hard to access. And number three, test results that can be improved or optimized with evidence-based, highly specific interventions. We want you to, to be able to improve them, shift your health in a favorable direction very strategically. So from that long laundry list, we were able to deduce or we'll reduce that down to 10 important markers. We called these the 10 truths. And these kind of offer a window into four key systems of the body. Cardiovascular health, which are the, the top three. So if you look at column one, these are the markers from ApoB all the way down to the flourishing scale. Those are the 10 markers or 10 truths. ApoB, VO2 max, and blood pressure, they are a window into cardiovascular health. The next four, HbA1c, fasting blood glucose, triglycerides, and waist circumference to height ratio, those are really a window into 
metabolic health. Grip strength and bone mineral density. Those are, offer a window into your musculoskeletal health. And then the flourishing scale is a tool that offers a window into psychological, emotional health. We'll come back to this. That's the, the most important kind of thing to know for now. So I want to I want to walk you through an example of one of these ten truths and why we've why we've chosen it. And so here we're looking at VO2 max. So VO2 max is one of these ten truths. As I mentioned, it is a uh, a, a key marker that can predict cardiovascular disease risk and also longevity. And what you're you're seeing here. On this, on this graph, this is from a large cohort study, and it was looking at uh, risk of mortality, so dying during the study follow-up period, which was about eight years. And the, the graph separates out people that had low VO2 max, below average, above average, high, and elite. elite. Just going from low... To above average, which someone can do with about 150 minutes of moderate intensity cardiovascular training a week, equated to about a 60 to 70% reduction in mortality. This is from a similar study here. And what I want you to appreciate, we don't have to go too much in, into the details of the numbers on this figure, but low VO2 max is associated with a higher risk of death than having diabetes, coronary artery disease, end-stage renal disease, smoking, or hypertension. Not only is VO2 max a really good predictor of cardiovascular disease risk and mortality, it can also be easily and accurately measured. So the gold standard is a VO2 max test with an exercise physiologist in a lab. And so you can see a photo here of a gentleman on the right. He's doing that on a bike. It can be done on a bike or it can be done on a treadmill. Now, one of the things I mentioned earlier was it's important for us to make sure these tests are accessible. This will be accessible to some people, but it does come at a cost. It could be anywhere between 100 $150, depending on the lab and the country that someone's in. But there are field, field tests which are zero cost that very closely approximate VO2 max. So you can do a beep test or a shuttle test or a six-minute walk test. And these are things that within our Living Proof uh, framework, we help guide people on. So if they want to do a shuttle test, the instructions are in there. And at the end of your shuttle test, you can use a table and very quickly see what your VO2 max or um, approximated VO2 max is from that. So we've gone through the first two criteria. One has to be a good predictor of L-span longevity or life satisfaction. Two, it has to be something that we can reliably and accessibly measure. And three, it has to be something that we can improve with a highly specific evidence-based intervention or interventions. So there is a lot of research looking at different types of exercise and how they affect VO2 max. It's not uncommon to get a 10 to 20% increase in VO2 max with, a, with high intensity exercise. And that's in trials that usually last anywhere from kind of four to 12 weeks. So there is a school of thought that, you know, we can probably increase our VO2 max by much more than that if we were running trials that went six months, 12 months, 18 months. Um, on the right-hand side here, I'm just showing two protocols which have been shown to successfully improve VO2 max. The purpose here is not to go into the, the details. We do that within the challenge, um, but just high level here, the top one is a what's called a four by four minute hit protocol. So this is where you're doing four minutes of 
uh, exercise, let's call it running at an eight out of 10 effort. And then you have a three minute break and you repeat that another three times. And the one below is a 10 by one minute sprint interval training protocol where you do one minute on at a maximum effort and then have one minute rest, one minute on one minute rest. And you do that for 10 efforts. Um, of course, there's a, a warm up period before jumping into either of these. Thank you.